welcome. Thanks for being here today. Um, just quickly have to acknowledge what happened yesterday. Uh, there was a violent attack on Donald Trump. And uh, we don't know a lot at this point other than it's not good. And so I just, I don't know how to respond. I don't know how to react. Really trying to rest in uh, just compassion. Compassion for him. Compassion for all of us who have to deal with the fallout uh, is not a good omen. And I just hope I spent a long time yesterday and definitely in our service this morning just doing whatever little energetic work I can do that we can do to make this event a turning point for good and for peace realizing how delicate and fragile and vulnerable we are. Maybe this could be a wake up call to come together for greater peace. Doesn't look that way. <laughs> Doesn't look likely. Um, but whatever tiny little ripple we can create in that direction, uh, I hope you'll join me in that effort. Um, so that's a somber start and I do want to shift to something that uh, I really wanted to talk about. It's a very important topic and um, yeah, we're going to have to keep it real today. So I hope you all are with me here. Um, but I needed to respond to something that came up uh, when Helen Torkoff was here. She was our guest speaker a couple weeks ago. Uh, Helen is a lifetime practitioner. She was the founder of Tricycle Magazine. She's like this big Buddhist, you know, American Buddhist culture icon. And so she came and uh, was, you know, very generous with her time. And we had kind of a question and answer session. And I thought it was uh, great. It was a great opportunity to hear from her. And one of the questions that was asked of her was, what are you excited about or feeling positive about in American Buddhism moving forward? And what are you concerned about? What are you worried about for the future of Buddhism? And uh, her answer for what she's excited about was technology, I think. She said, you know, at first she was skeptical that Zoom could like really keep sanghas together, uh, but after seeing a few years now of this kind of digital practice era. Um, she says she's feeling very positive and that you can actually have kind of a full Dharma experience with your community online. Uh, so that's cool. But what she was concerned about is kind of what I want to address today. And she said what she was concerned about, and I thought this was very brave and controversial and just real. Uh, she said the thing she's most concerned about for Buddhism moving forward is, and I'm not quoting her directly, uh, I'm simply just saying what I took from what she said, um, so I don't want to put words in her mouth. It could have been different, but, you know, we take away what we take away, and so uh, this is what I wanted to address. I, I think she said something along the lines of, Woke culture, you know, so impossible to use that word these days uh, in any kind of clear way. So woke culture, social justice culture, radical inclusion, um, however you want to say it, um, whatever initiatives are actively fighting for equity, and healing, 
uh, in a nation built on oppression and marginalization of certain communities. However you want to call that, she's worried that the pressure from that work in Buddhist communities is somehow compromising, threatening, or diluting uh, the original integrity of Buddhist teachings. And she says she worries that there are teachers who are compromising the teaching to acquiesce and accommodate the demands from social justice. And A, this is a very alive conversation in like all spiritual communities right now. So it's a very relevant topic. And B, as she was saying it, I had to kind of acknowledge that I'm one of those teachers that she's talking about, that she's worried about. Um, and we're one of those communities that she's talking about. Um, there definitely have been a number of times where certain aspects of our training, certain aspects of the teaching get met with opposition and resistance from the perspective of social justice, diversity, equity, radical inclusion. And I, uh, you know, to this point, uh, for various reasons, typically just say, okay, whatever you need. Um, and so that was really loud for me. Um, a couple ways this shows up is A, the discipline aspect of Zen, the austerity of the discipline that we have here, a lot of choreography, um, dress code. You know, we ask everybody to wear simple, dark clothing with no writing or symbols on it. Uh, we ask people to stay still. We ask people not to talk. We ask people to move this way. Don't walk that way. And there's kind of a culture of like really holding that discipline um, and correcting. And there are people not just from social justice movements, but even from other Buddhist lineages who say, wow, that's really not trauma informed at all and is really quite triggering and not inclusive. And so on many occasions here at Sweetwater, we've been like, okay, well, let's take a look at that and let's change that. Even though that discipline, that austerity is so integral to the tradition that we have. Um, another way that shows up is in the teachings. Um, the best way I can kind of simply put it is social justice work, um, identity politics, healing, so socio-political healing really sees the root of suffering. I don't know, I guess I can't speak for an entire <laughs> movement of sociologists and activists, but it seems that the emphasis is that suffering comes from external circumstances, oppression, marginalization, access, policies, history. This is what has caused suffering, I think. And, you know, this is going to be a conversation, so please, like, um, have your responses at the ready. But with the social justice work I've done, the training I've done, it seems that the emphasis is on how can we change things outside. Um, and then in Buddhism, while there certainly is a big emphasis on taking action, uh, being of service to others in the outside world, the main teaching, the basic <laughs> fundamental teaching of the Buddha is that the root of suffering is from within. That the very notion, the very idea 
that I am a separate person, separate from anything else, is why we suffer. Not the institutions, not the policies. Yes, those do create extra suffering, but that the root of suffering is from within. It's our attachments, our ideas, and our concepts sticking to our mind, our self. And so it makes a lot of sense that for folks who are really focused on changing things in the external world, to be told actually your suffering is coming from within you isn't going to jive. And again, I'm one of those teachers that Helen is talking about because I've witnessed that where I give Dharma talks or I meet someone one to one, one on one and talk about the nature of suffering being an internal thing and there's big resistance. And so being one of those teachers that Helen is worried about, I've said, well, okay, I guess I won't really talk about that. Or I have to find tricky ways to like kind of imply that, but not really address. So it's true. There really is a kind of dilution and a compromise of this ancient, ancient way in order to make our Sangha more accessible, to make the Dharma and our practice less triggering and more inclusive. So it is a problem. It is a conundrum. And every Zen teacher, Zen center, Buddhist teacher, everyone I know in the religious spiritual realm is dealing with this. And so I just thought we could kind of quickly look at it together. I have no answers. I have no solid conclusion about how these things mesh and how this all works. I just kind of wanted to be brave and open up this conversation for us. I think this conversation will continue for decades, centuries in our modern world. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of introduce this conversation or, you know, continue this conversation. Uh, and I thought the best way to do that would maybe be in the context of the three tenets. Uh, and for those of you who are kind of new or newish to our community and our practice, uh, you're going to hear a lot of numbered lists. The Four Noble Truths, the Four Remembrances, the Eightfold Path, the Eight Remembrances, the Five Buddha Families, the Three Treasures, the Three Pure Precepts, the Ten Bodhisattva Vows, the, or the Ten uh, Precepts, the Four Bodhisattva, it goes on. Um, the Three Tenets are something, they're kind of new. It's a new, newish numbered list that was pretty much... Uh, formulated by my or our Dharma grandfather, Bernie Tetsugen Glassman Roshi. He was one of the first American Zen uh, teachers. He's our founder's teacher. Our founder is Saison. Her teacher was Bernie. So he kind of created this practice of the three tenets. And um, you know, really working with the three tenets is to see them as this kind of like ever swirling spiral circular kind of practice, right? So all three tenets are always at play. We work in and out of one and the other in no particular order. It's just this big kind of life koan, uh, working with the three tenets broadly. However, there's also a use um, in seeing these three tenets as linear. So we start with the first one, that takes us to the second one, and that leads to the third one. And, you know, it's really the, the power of the practice is to see it as constantly moving in and out of every tenet. But whenever I'm faced with a conundrum or a challenge or a wrinkle, um, some kind of stuck place, using the three tenets in a linear way really helps. So I thought we could kind of look at this thing quickly 
uh, through that lens. So the first tenet is not knowing or non-knowing. Uh, and we hear a lot about non-knowing. It shows up in all the texts, many koans. Um, the practice of non-knowing. And just a quick word about that. Not knowing is way more than just like forgetting what you know. It's much more than a, a lack of knowledge uh, or suspending what you think you know. Not knowing is a lifestyle. Not knowing is a commitment. It's an embodiment. Constant, continuous commitment to letting go to really feeling the universe slipping through our fingers all the time. It doesn't mean we don't have values. It doesn't mean we don't have discerning judgments about things. It means that we're committed to a lifelong practice of flow, of openness, of welcoming impermanence. Um, it's because of course we know things. I know that it's Sunday. Um, I know that it's summer and it's hot. But can we hold the things that we know with an open palm instead of a closed fist? It's kind of one way to think about it. So this first tenet of not knowing, allowing all of our judgments all of our preconceived notions, I'm sure all of us have all these ideas about social justice and race and gender and equity and inclusivity and Buddhism and awakening and enlightenment just swirling in our heads right now. So I just want to invite us to take a minute um, to engage in the practice of not knowing. And one of the ways that we do that is Zazen. That is what Zazen practice is, is cultivating our relationship with this non-knowing, opening up to the emptiness of everything. So just oblige me and just for a second, let's just do some Zazen. Allow everything that you're thinking right now, all of your values and judgments and concepts just simply drop away. And whether your Zazen is counting your breath or being your breath or sitting with a koan or just listening or shikantaza, all these different little practices we have, just give yourself permission to take refuge in that and come into contact with non-knowing. Notice how that feels in your body. All of these topics of equity, oppression, historical calamity, spiritual awakening, they're so triggering, they're so full. And so really take a moment to acknowledge what it feels like just for this moment, take refuge in your breath. Allowing all of that to just drop away. So that's the practice of the first tenet of not knowing. So then from this place, from this cultivation of non-knowing, total emptiness, we can move into the second tenet, which is bearing witness. Bearing witness. And really feel what that's like to bear witness from a place of not knowing. Most of the time we bear witness to things bringing all of our filters and patterns and understandings and judgments and habits 
but this pure, genuine, bearing witness, just like a baby, no preconceived notions, no filters, just simply receiving data, perceiving, totally selfless perceiving. So in this case, from a place of not knowing, we bear witness to the fact that we have this Zen center. And uh, we are sitting in this yurt in a garden. And uh, the reason that we're here is because we have status with the Secretary of State and the IRS as a church. And therefore we get donations and we can have a residency. And the reason that we're here, the very basic reason that we're able to do all that is because we have been empowered and sanctioned to be a religious nonprofit carrying the ancient Buddha way. Our founder, Sasin, could open this place up because her teacher said, you now carry this 2,500 year old teaching of no self, of awakening, of the Buddha way. Carry on that teaching into the future. And that includes the discipline and the forms and everything that she carried on. That's the reason we're here. Because she knew and was empowered and acknowledged as someone who could continue that. With all of the mindfulness practices of bowing and chanting and hold your hands this way and walk that way and don't walk this way and help each other and correct each other. That is why we're here. It's the reason we opened a Zen center. Um, and that's our mission. The, the official filed with the Secretary of State mission of Sweetwater Zen Center is we have this vow to carry forth the Buddha way as it has been handed down to us. Then we bear witness to another part of our vow, which is sharing and spreading the Dharma serving and awakening as many people as possible. And that's the Bodhisattva vow, or at least part of the Bodhisattva vow, right? The first vow we chant, beings are boundless. We vow to serve, we vow to awaken the boundless beings in the universe. And we also vow uh, that awakening is unsurpassable. We vow to practice. We vow to practice that awakening of emptiness, no self, awakening to the fact that suffering comes from within. The moment that I separate myself from anything as a self, that's how suffering happens. Then we bear witness and again, trying to come from this place of not knowing, we bear witness to the fact that we have received this teaching in a country that was built and founded on subjugation, dehumanization of certain communities and peoples. It's built on white supremacy. It's built on male-centered, male-dominated patriarchy, built on an understanding of a dual gender system, uh, and built on slavery. That's just facts. That's not a judgment or an opinion. That is just simply facts, bearing witness to the history of this nation and our society. 
And now we get to bear witness to the fact that we have a little bit of a rub because we have this vow to spread and share the Dharma as much as we can. We have a vow to be inclusive. We have a vow to make this practice accessible to all beings. And we have a vow to continue our way. And now we bear witness to the fact that it kind of makes sense that if you're in one of these populations that has been marginalized, oppressed, dehumanized, unheard, that to come into a white, very often male dominated space and be told what you can wear, be told where you can move and how, and to be told that your suffering is actually coming from within you doesn't seem right. And it kind of puts our vow to make this practice accessible to everyone very much in jeopardy. And again, coming from a place of not knowing, this is just fact. This is just what's happening. And then we bear witness to the fact that there are actually tons of people from those communities, people of color, queer folks, non-binary folks, uh, I think, uh, the disabled, who do this practice very willingly and successfully. Um, you know, I attended the Black and Buddhist Summit in 2021. It was a series of interviews and lectures from Black Buddhist teachers. And, you know, the way that those teachers were able to maintain the ancient integrity of the teaching of the Buddha and be able to talk about their identity and their experience as a Black American and stay true to their ancestors and talk about their reality as black people while staying true to the ancient Buddha way that suffering is from within was just spectacular. So if anyone has the desire or the time to look up the black and Buddhist summit hosted by Ayo Yatunde. Uh, I think there are a couple videos on YouTube for free, but you also might be able to pay for access to all the videos. I highly, highly recommend it. Bear witness to that series of teachings. And I bear witness to the fact that like those teachers abilities to bring in all sides is good for the Dharma. Like that's just the best way I can put it inviting people from all kinds of communities, colors, creeds, sexualities, genders, all the stuff will be good for Buddhism. It will make Buddhism better. It will make awakening deeper. But we also have to stay true to the tradition. So um, then we also bear witness to the fact that like this is pretty new. The idea of inviting people from different walks of life uh, in an urban lay context, um, honoring different identities. This is some brand new shit, y'all. Like, this is a 2,500 year old practice that, for at least 90% of the time that it was practiced, I think I can safely say, I may be wrong, I'm not a historian, but I think we can say for at least 80 or 90% of the time was practiced in homogenous communities. So we just bear witness to the fact that we're an experiment. We're working through this. We're learning. We're messing up. We're going to fail. We are failing. I'm failing right now. 
So this is the second tenet, just bearing witness to what's going on, what's happening, how are we feeling, what are the facts on the ground. And then the third tenet is that from this not knowing bearing witness, loving action will naturally arise. So the third tenet is loving action. Um, and really the, the magic there is, you know, a lot of time we think about action, loving action, compassionate action, social action as like taking charge, making something happen. And that's great. A lot of times we need that. But from the perspective of these three tenets, the loving action really just naturally arises as we bear witness the right action to take just simply reveals itself. And for us so far, sometimes that means, all right, maybe you don't have to sit still. That makes sense. Okay, you know what? We're not gonna correct people in the Zendo. We're gonna drop that tradition away. For others, maybe the loving action that arises is like, no, we need to hold fast to the traditions and I don't care who it triggers. I'm here to uphold this ancient tradition and so I'm gonna tell you what to wear and I'm gonna tell you how to move and I'm gonna really have faith in this practice of discipline and mindfulness. I don't know, this isn't about finding the right answer. It's about finding genuine loving action as it arises for you and for us as a Sangha. So bearing witness to the fact that we're new at this and that we're failing, my loving action is forgiving myself. Forgiving Sweetwater for being all white very often. Um, luckily, not all the time. So, yeah, I really hope this serves as an invitation to explore this, an invitation to maybe drop away things we've been hanging on to, an invitation to engage in some of these ancient traditions, and an invitation to maybe let go of some of these ancient traditions as they're working or not working, as they are serving or not serving. Because ultimately that's just what we wanna do. We want to serve all beings. We want to be stewards of the Buddha way. Uh, and we wanna do it in sweet water fashion. It's up to us, y'all. There's no, there's no guidelines here. We are in experimental, dangerous, beautiful, alive territory right now. And I look forward to investigating it further with you all into the future. So we have about 20 minutes for about 20 years worth of conversation here. Um, please. Please um, allow your loving action to respond now. Mm -hmm.